Back laughing, hoping that I get signed. Now I own my own tracks, riding waves of the hyper mind. Popular and dirt poor broke. That ain't my type of grind. If I got started. Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your host, Mongo Slate. Today we're going to be talking about AEW Dynamite from June the 8th, 2022. I am fully in the camp that Tony Khan has got to be one of the most out of his mind producers of professional wrestling. I think we have seen since the days of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. He's off his gourd. Seeing this show sucked. All right. This show sucked. There's so much to discuss on this show that even if there was any news and notes to discuss, I wasn't going to go into them. Let's talk about this battle royal. This here casino royale. Let's talk about this thing. 30 minutes of absolute brutality. Brutality, not because it was good. Brutality because it was absolutely hot shit kebab. So for starters, Max Caster, he comes out, I don't know when he came out, it doesn't matter. He claimed he broke CM Punk's foot. All right, so I guess he's trying to get some heat. Whatever. Tag partner and stables were coming out together for the most part. This is supposed to be like a random draw. And yet, most of the tag team partners came out together with st and stable mates came out together. Very weird. Darby Allen jumped off the top rope onto the floor. Was not eliminated. Nobody mentioned this. Nobody said anything. I clearly saw Darby Allen jump off the top rope, which is over the top rope, onto the floor. He was not eliminated. Very odd decision. Now, <laughs> he mill maskerist himself. If you remember mill maskerist from Roy Rumble 97, he jumped over the top rope. Yeah, that's what Darby Allen did, and no big deal. Swerve threw out Keith Lee uh, over the top rope, his own tag team partner, and then laughed at him. I <laughs> says a lot about what they think about Keith Lee, right? That he gets eliminated by Swerve, who. <laughs> Whatever. The Joker in this match was Andrade. Andrade del Idolo. Look at me. Look at me. Mr. Charlotte Flair. Nice. Back from his wedding. Guess he skipped the honeymoon part. They ain't, they ain't been married that long. Been married like a week. He's back already. So this battle royal was like 25 guys. It featured no Samoa Joe. No Adam Cole. No Brian Danielson, no Chris Jericho, no Hangman Page, no Wardlow, no Christian, no Sammy Guevara, no Ethan Page, no Pentagon Jr., no Malachi Black, ne neither member of FTR, no Jungle Boy, no Jeff Hardy, no Miro, no Johnny Elite. Nobody, they brought out the Rampage crew for this Battle Royal. Full Rampage crew. The final four for this match was Andrade El Idolo, Wheeler, Utah, Andrade, and Kyle O'Reilly. A absolutely star-studded Final Four. Four completely believable contenders for your world title. Wait a minute, I, I put, did I put Andrade twice? It's Andrade, Wheeler, Utah, Kyle O'Reilly, and it was another guy. It doesn't matter. It might have been Swerve. It was Swerve, I think. Eddie Kingston was eliminated by Jake Hager. <laughs> Do you think they would try to curry some kind of good, some kind of good wheel with this whole interim championship thing? They would try to make a good, feel good story out of this thing. Nope. Keith Lee out. Darby Allen out. <laughs> The final two are Kyle O'Reilly and Wheeler Yuta. Kyle O'Reilly wins this match to an epic, absolutely epic reaction, which was not even Chiquita's at midnight. People were more excited three, 30 seconds before the bell than 30 seconds after the bell. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. 
you couldn't have made a more obvious situation for this whole thing. Now, this battle royal was so dumb. Just looking at the roster of guys that was in it. And you could have a completely different battle royal that would be a lot more exciting and a lot more believable of the guys who weren't in it than the guys who were. Uh, WWE sometimes, they only get one shot. You know, at the Royal Rumble, they get one shot a year for people to really care about a battle royal. And sometimes they miss the boat. Sometimes they dare do, they forget the obvious. You know, we want Daniel Bryan to win the Royal Rumble. He's not even in it. That's a mistake. But this is for your interim championship. This is supposed to be for your world title. You put none of who anybody would consider to be a top contender in this match. Nobody. Most of the people, this was how bad it was. It was so bad that later on in the show, I'm not even going in order because why? who cares? Later in the show, Wardlow shit on this whole thing. I wasn't in it because CM Punk is our world champion. And if I'm not pinning him or making him tap out, I don't want it. I'm like, oh, well, all these guys who are fighting to be the interim champion might as well all go jump in a fucking lake. Because what the hell were you doing? A guy who's never accomplished any fucking thing in AEW tells you that what you're doing is meaningless. Wardlow just became officially a wrestler on the roster. And he seemingly has more sense than half the fucking roster. Well, if I'm not going to be the lineal world champion, I don't want that asterisk belt. I mean, mm, I'd rather have that completely, totally devalued, by my own admission, devalued TNT title. Eddie Kingston wants to fight Jake Hager. He's also mad at being counted down because that's what that's Eddie Kingston's gimmick. Him and John Moxley, they're not fans of uh, TV people telling them, hey, you got to hit your time cues. So he's got to make sure that everybody knows that he's a rebel and he's against the system. Don't count me down. Don't count me down. I, I get it. I, I get it. Don't, talk, don't count me down. Like, mm. uh, oh, my Jesus. John Moxley is pacing and simmering like a wild panther. He says that he's been hunting in New J- big game hunting in New Japan for three years. Three years of banging around in AEW. Says Colorado is going to be in there with the wrong guy at the wrong time. Forbidden door belongs to him, always has. At the end at the end of this whole thing, the entire sports will belong to him. Later, Kyle O'Reilly gets a lecture from his uh mentor, William Regal. William Regal says he taught that he taught this guy a lot. But Moxley even sends shivers down his spine and asks him if he's really ready for this. Think of your family, think of your kids. It's gonna be a shame to see Moxley split your head open. And he's going to be on commentary for this thing. I said, praise God. Finally, somebody's going to be there to try to help me make it through this goddamn show. Kyler Riley says that his family is all he thinks about when he's out there. And he came to AEW to do two things. Fight the best and become the world champion. And tonight he has an opportunity to do both. The main event of this show was John Moxley versus Kyle Riley. Of course, John Moxley wins. Incredibly physical match. I will give the guys credit. They tried real hard. They got over the people in the crowd who wanted to be convinced and wanted to see a good wrestling match. They they got over on these people. The rest of the United States looked at this paper and said, there's zero chance of Kyle O'Reilly winning this match, for starters. Secondly, am I really interested in this match? You know, with no storyline, no real intrigue. I mean, at least they did promos for it, which is better and you know than they usually do for an AEW world title or AEW main event. Usually these guys will not they'll act like it's just another day at the office. This was at least they two both guys had promos where we walked in and you know we kind of got a little something back and forth between these two guys or how much they wanted it. At the very least, we got that. But for the most part, it was very difficult for me to stay focused on this match. Because I simply didn't care. I simply didn't care. 
I mean, I knew Moxley was winning when I found out he got a buy. I was like, oh, we're going to give the big fish. We're going to give him the easy road. Why again? Why even go through all this? Why even waste our time with the battle royal? Why waste our time with the damn near 20 minute match with Kyle O'Reilly? We knew Moxley was winning. Moxley could have just won the battle royal and says, I'm waiting for, you know, an opponent. And it's amazing to me that Wardlow has no interest in being the AEW world champion, but somehow Hiroki Goto does. Hiroki Goto, a guy who has wrestled zero matches in AEW. Zero. Has a, has a, has more of an opportunity to be the world champion than Eddie Kingston. Has more opportunity to be the world champion than Malachi Black. <laughs> has more of an opportunity to be world champion than any of the guys he's been force pushing on us. Even Orange Cassidy and guys like him won in this thing. I'm not even saying I wanted them in there. But I'm saying is, look at the roster of guys that was in this thing. I'm not going to read who was in it. I just told you who wasn't in it. So you probably already know all the garbage individuals that were in it. <sighs> what what a bunch of scrubs. What a scrub-ass series this was. This was embarrassing. Tony Khan should be ashamed of himself, but I know he's not because his fanboys probably ate this thing alive. And I was just floored by the entire concept that we wasted mm, about an hour of the show on such a pathetic concept that featured nobody, one big star out of the whole ordeal was John Moxley. And we gave him a bye. And then he beat somebody who had to wrestle early in the night. So big, tough guy, John Moxley. Some guy had to wrestle twice. Whatever. Good job, Tony Khan. <laughs> You're really doing a good job of siphoning off all that goodwill you started this company with. And it's for some people, it's already gone. But for me, I see him as a big dork with a, with a deep pocketbook. I don't really see him as being malicious. You know, and that's the difference. And sometimes people are just stupid. They just don't know that much. They're just ignorant or naive. And I think that's really what it is with Tony Khan. He's just kind of naive that there is, you know a million, two million people who think like he does. And even if this show does well, I don't see it boding well in the long term because of the decisions that he's made. I can see people sticking with the Battle Royal throughout the show, you know, coming in and maybe sticking with the Battle Royal to say, hey, I want to see who's in it in the hopes that people are going to be in it. There was people out there who were saying, the Joker was going to be some New Japan guy. The Joker was going to be somebody special, some big deal. The Joker was Andrade, who got little to no reaction. This is what AEW did to this fucking guy. All these dudes were more over the day they debuted than they are now. Months after the fact. And that's a testament to AEW's booking philosophy their booking style, and what they've had creatively for these guys. There has been no character arcs. There has been no development. There has been nothing. No, nothing matters. Look, I don't mind him putting the belt on John Moxley again. I, I, I have already assumed Moxley is going to win the interim title. I don't care. That's fine. It's one of the right decisions. Of course, the best decision is Danielson. But Moxley's a good third option, second option, all right? He's not bad. But I see that AEW Dynamite, without Danielson, without Punk, without MJF, is it's a hollow show. I'm talking this show hurt. And people thought SmackDown was suffering without Roman. This show, without... Punk and MJF? Ugh. Ugh. Mm. Now, SmackDown, of course, SmackDown also lost a lot of talent. You know, Charlotte, somebody they push a lot. She's not there. And Roman's not there. We can easily say that, hey, they got a thin roster. It's like AEW's supposed to have everybody 
That's yo, they're taking all the WWE stars. It's like, yeah, but they're not using them. And they're not using them properly. And if nobody's getting over, what difference does it make that they, if they had these people on the roster? It makes no sense. You could pay whoever you want. It's not about the names. It will never be about the names. Never. It's always going to be about what you do with them. So they doubled down on the dumb shit. Oh, we got the the battle royal. That was a thing. It occurred. But now we're going to bring you a brand new championship. And I said to myself, okay, so about to finally introduce the trios title that they've been, you know, whispering about. For, for a little while now. And it says the All Atlantic Championship. I said pardon? All Atlantic Championship? Another singles title for the men. A third singles championship for the men. Okay. And then I looked at the belt. And the belt clearly features. And I want to make people. I'm going to make sure. That uh, that people understand what I'm talking about here. That belt has the Mexican flag on it, the Chinese flag, the United Kingdom, the Union Jack, the American flag, the Canadian flag, and the Japanese flag. Okay, but if you know anything about geography. And where the Atlantic Ocean actually is. And just in case you're a little slow on the uptake, the Atlantic Ocean is the ocean that borders uh, the the uh, Atlantic part of the United States. So the New, uh, I say New Orleans, the New England area, the Carolinas, uh, Virginia, Florida, that's the Atlantic Ocean. Okay? The Pacific Ocean borders California. Oregon, uh, Washington, etc. Japan is on that side of the world. Japan is n- got nothing to do with the Atlantic Ocean. Nothing. China is landlocked, at least as far as I know. It might not be. But even if it isn't, it's not on the Atlantic side of the world. Is on the Pacific side of the world. Why is China and Japan on this title? This title is is blowing my mind already. All right, it's already blown my mind. You know, Australia not in the Atlantic. I'm sorry to tell you, got nothing to do with the Atlantic Ocean. All right, <laughs> got, got nothing to do with it. I tried to, in my head, say, okay, this is kind of like their version of the Intercontinental title, right? You know, the TNT belts is kind of a TD belt. This is kind of the Intercontinental Championship, because Intercontinental, when you look at the title or what it means, Intercontinent, across continents or something like, well, it'll be transcontinent, but Intercontinent, that's basically saying world. All Atlantic is like saying half the fucking world. It's half a world title. I guess. And I just looked at this and I said, what is the difference between this belt and the TNT belt? It reminds me of what uh, Eric Bischoff said about the X division title that he said, Hey, what makes the X division title different from the, from the world title? And that if you have all of these belts, they need to be individualized. There has to be a reason why one belt is ranked higher than another or is more interesting than another. Because if you don't, People will see it as just being a duplicate title. This was the reason why he was a proponent of putting weight limits on the X Division title, which a lot of people complained about, and I was one of them. I was one of those people that said, hey, he's ruined the X Division belt by making it a cruiserweight title. But in his world, in his vision, it gives it more meaning because only certain people can win it, and there are certain criteria in order to win it. Just like a TV title. A TV title, you have to you have to win the match in 20 minutes or something like that. It makes the matches stand out. It makes the matches different than all the other more standard championship matches. I understand that. How is the All-Atlantic belt going to be any different 
in the TNT belt. We haven't been told that yet. But then I saw something that made me laugh and I said to myself, that's probably the better way to go. It's not AEW's Intercontinental title. It's AEW's European Championship. Especially considering they kept saying to them, to, to us, the people on TV, the people who watch it on TV, rather, AEW, AEW is the number one wrestling company in the United Kingdom. And I was like, oh, so it finally dethroned TNA. <laughs> TNA for about a decade was the number one wrestling company in in uh in the Europe in the European Union, <laughs> the UK. WWE wasn't. It was TNA for a long time. TNA was like getting higher ratings in in uh in England and stuff than the WWE. That is true. It's true. So now AEW is the number one wrestling company in Europe or in the UK. And they've created this championship for the UK viewers, for all the what cultures and the wrestle talks and the, the voices of wrestling and all the other Euro trash that love their show. This is for you. This ain't for you snooty Americans who still watch the WWE. This is for all of my European buddies who promote our show via their podcast and YouTube channels. Well, guess what? Congratulations. Good job. Good job. But still have to explain. Maybe you can explain to them why you got countries that's on the that borders the Pacific Ocean on this fucking belt. Maybe they can help you with your geography. You know, I know they, they're willing to swallow your book in whole cloth. Can they really swallow your bad geography? <laughs> Can can one of these head slapping uh, Nick Nogs over in Europe buy you a globe, an encyclopedia, so you can know where the hell the Atlantic Ocean is? Dog, man, dog, bruh. Okay, so now let's look at the brackets of this thing. The brackets uh, have featured Buddy Matthews, who is Australian, Pac, who is from the United Kingdom, Ethan Page versus Miro. Okay, Miro is Bulgarian, and Ethan Page is Canadian. Penta Oscuro, who is Mexican, Malachi Black, who is Dutch, and two unnamed New Japan guys. Because we got to have New Japan involved. So two unnamed New Japan guys. What the fuck? Why didn't Why didn't AAA get their own bracket? Your partners with AAA, they should got their own bracket. Why New Japan get a bracket and nobody else? Why you can't book your own shit? I'm just, I was just saying like, my God, bro, everything about this is an absolute fumble. For starters, you don't need another singles title. I don't even need to say that. And people kept saying, but WWE got all these different titles. I'm like, look, WWE got four fucking brands, man. And even if you hard, if you hard brand split, then you need most of them. Okay. You need to have a top title, a singles title, a woman's title and a tag team title. You need at least three of those belts. If you have a hard brand split, the least you could do is have a world title, a mid card title, a tag team championship, and then something for the women. Now, women's title. That's four belts. Four belts times four brands and 16 belts. That's too many. But if nobody's crossing over, then everybody has their own thing to fight for. But when you have, like they're doing now, everybody's just jumping back and forth, you see they just decided, okay, the two world titles combine those. The two tag team titles combine those. Eventually, they may combine the two women's titles and the uh, the two mid-card titles, and then we'll probably be done with the brand split completely at that point. But NXT needs to have its own belts. And NXT UK needs to have its own belts. They can't easily cross over because NXT UK is way on the other side of the world. They can't easily cross over. But you can't have an NXT UK and nobody has nothing to fight for. That doesn't make any sense. All right. So if you want anybody to actually watch this shit, there has to be something we're fighting for. That's the, the concept of why you need titles. But AEW, you already absorbed all the fucking ROH belts. You already got FTR with the ROH belts and the AAA belts. 
You had you've had guys from four different companies walking around with world titles on this fucking show. I'm getting confused. It's like boxing. The WBA, WBO, IBF, UFO, and UFC, TGF, World Heavyweight Championship. I'm like, what? Ring magazine world title. I'm like, the pound for pound knockout champion. You're like, what? What? At, at some point, everybody in this fucking company gonna have a belt. Cause they're still teasing the trios titles. Is this it? Is this it? This all Atlantic thing that clearly isn't all Atlantic. Rename it. If you're going to keep the belt, just rename it. <laughs> all Atlantic. Fucking Japan. <laughs> Fucking Japan. All Atlantic. Japan. Oh, oh boy. They call it the land of the rising sun. This motherfucker put it on an all Atlantic belt. Have mercy. All right. I guess I, I guess I have to guess who's going to win this thing because, you know, the belt, the title is going to be on the line at Forbidden Door. That's when the champion is going to be um, decided. So the Forbidden Door already has two championships. Decided. By the way, the it would wouldn't it be sweet if they brought over the Stardom champion to wrestle uh, Thunder Rosa? I have I've heard nothing about that. Now Stardom is owned by the same company that owns New Japan. They of course do. They rarely do crossovers between Stardom and New Japan. But if you're going to do Forbidden Door, <clears throat> we should probably get some of the girls from Stardom to come over. Otherwise, you're really just going to fuck over your women's division because it was this way when you did Forbidden Door with Kenny Omega and it was just a bunch of guys jumping over. And then when Deanna Perrazzo was like, hey, what about the girls? Everybody was like, shh, sweet summer child. We're not doing that right now. She eventually got over to Dynamite to do the job to lose her ROH belt. But that was it. (laughs) You know, that was it. So are they going to bring in the stardom girls? You know, who knows? How about all the girls from AAA? Like, I, I just, people are acting like AAA is not a major wrestling promotion. It is. It's the most successful wrestling promotion in Mexico. I know Mexico is a third world country. And, you know, but it borders the United States. Think about that for a moment. If you are Tony Khan, you're supposed to be this big stats guy. And you constantly like, we're big in Chicago. We're big in New York. Guess what, dum dum? They have large Hispanic populations. You should definitely get more Hispanics on your show. Not just relying on the three that you have. You should be bringing in Latinas. You should be bringing in more luchador- luchadoras. You should be doing more with AAA. Especially since we apparently have no borders in the United States and there's illegals all over the fucking place. You might as well just, especially if you're going to be running in Texas and, and shit like that, you definitely need more Mexicans. You should definitely treat the Mexicans a little bit better. Because there's not a lot of crazy Japanese people in the United States. Now, the American fans do love Japanese wrestling. The hardcores do. But... If you're really trying to hit those demographics, you need more Hispanics. You know, you need more Hispanics. WWE needs more Hispanics too. That's the one time I'm probably going to go full leftist on you. You know, Hispanics have been the backbone of the American wrestling scene for a long time and have been, quite frankly, underserved. Not in the WWE so much because there was Hispanics, world champions, back to Pedro Morales. You know, it didn't happen as often as they would like, but there's kind of always been a strong Hispanic audience in WWE. And they occasionally get this, the Eddie Guerrero's or the Pedro Morales or that Rey Mysterio, those kind of guys. They don't get as many as they probably should, but you know, it was there in AEW. They got nothing. You know, every time they bring in a big Hispanic star, they just job them out. You know, they kind of need some, so especially in, in a place like Chicago, which has a lot of Puerto Ricans and a lot of Mexicans, you could probably really 
gain a lot more fans if you diversified and brought in some of the Mexicans. Triple A holds one of the biggest wrestling organizations in the world. Triple Mania is huge. You know, why you would neglect that is beyond me. Especially when you have uh, the opportunity to, to 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 really cross over with them, to treat them like a, a little spoon. I know they're not big as New Japan, but you know they obviously don't protect their talent the same because they let their guys get jobs out on Impact, which is probably why they get treated the way that they do. But ultimately, uh, they they need to smarten up. But this All Atlantic thing, absolute miss. It's a miss. I don't see how this thing matters. I don't see how it matters. I really don't. It's like it's a nice looking belt. It looks just like the world title. It looks a lot like the women's belt. All the belts look the same. Beautiful belts. Really well made. Just don't see a reason for it. Uh, So who do I think is going to win this thing? Ultimately, if they were smart, they'd probably put the belt on Miro uh, or Malachi Black. To me, that should be the final. Miro versus Malachi Black. Um, but they're probably going to do something to get Malachi Black out of it. He may end up losing to Penta. Um, so I'm going to go with Miro being the first All Atlantic champion. Um, if I last I checked, Bulgaria is also landlocked. It's not in the Atlantic Ocean. Last I checked, I'm, I could be wrong. Now uh, that inner Europe, European area with Russia and all that kind of stuff, uh, I'm not so sure about that. But I'm fairly sure Bulgaria is not on the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> Pretty sure about that, but hey. Americans are going to get it eventually. And then uh, America does, you know, um, the Atlantic Ocean. We do border the Atlantic Ocean, so maybe give it to an American. But I guess they want to have a non-American champion. I guess. Do what you will. Do what thou wilt. You know, let's just do what thou wilt. Who cares? tournament began with Buddy Murphy um, Buddy Matthews losing to Pac via the Black Arrow. Fun match. We knew that these two guys can go but Buddy Matthews losing his singles debut what, four months after he signed to the company? <laughs> Make it sound like he was almost like a forgotten piece of this whole roster. Uh, he goes crawling back to the House of Black, a loser. Um now, Tony Khan did do something clever by mixing in the Death Triangle and the um, House of Black storyline into this tournament to give the singles matches more weight. Unfortunately, they're going to be carrying on a big hunk of metal. That won't mean a fucking thing. Trent Beretta comes out and he gets a middle of the ring promo. And it was at this point that I was like, this show is struggling without their strong promo guys. And not giving the mic to Eddie Kingston and John Moxley, letting those guys really go at it. Um, they gave the belt, they gave the mic to Trent Beretta. They gave him the stick. So he says that he's bummed out because he's got no best friends on National Best Friend Day. I just, I wanted to pitch myself down a flight of stairs. I was like, "Fuck's sake, get to the point." I don't. It didn't even take that long. I was just kind of like, I, I don't want to hear this guy's voice. Like I really, if you have, if you're gonna start with this, why, why do I care? Then he starts talking about Rapongi Vice didn't lose to FTR. They didn't win, but they didn't lose, and that um, they want another shot at the ROH belts. And I was like, okay, at least that makes sense. FTR comes out, they're unhappy that they didn't get to prove that they're the best tag team in the world, but says you shouldn't be upset with us. You should be upset with the guys who interfered with the match. And says that, well, and since Rocky Romero is in Japan anyway, we can't give you guys a title shot. So Rocky Romero, boring as he is, he's already back in Japan. Praise God. You know, praise God. That little motherfucker is not there. Then he referred to, I forget which one I want, called United Empire Will Ospreay's Bitch Boys. Upon, you say his name three times in the mirror, and Dillweed... Will Ospreay appears and he shows up, um, he gets a nice little reaction. Then United Empire jumps FTR and Trent and they beat them up. Everybody's very excited that um, the second best flipper in the world, Will Ospreay, has made made his appearance in AEW. Finally, Will Ospreay, a guy who, to be quite honest, fits AEW like a fucking glove. 
He fits like a glove in AEW. He is one of the guys that I think if he wasn't so dedicated to New Japan, he would have already been in AEW. Personally, I don't like Will Ospreay. You know, I'm not a fan. He's He sucks. You know, he just has no charisma. He has all the athletic gifts that a wrestler could have with almost none of the charisma. This is a guy who is constantly being dragged by other wrestlers. I mean, Seth Rollins just treats him like a soccer ball every time they even have any kind of uh, conversation on Twitter. He's just get, constantly getting kicked back and forth. And speaking of Will Ospreay, because I didn't talk about this before. And since I don't care about anything else on this goddamn show, let's talk about this. Will Ospreay said a couple of weeks ago that WWE wrestlers aren't real wrestlers. They're more like actors playing a role. And you know what? I don't even completely disagree with him. He's not wrong. The problem is he's not a real wrestler either. He's a gymnast who does gymnastic routines and fucking street fighter fight scenes in the middle of the goddamn ring. He is a really bad extra in a Jackie Chan movie. That's how shitty Will Ospreay is. It doesn't matter what he has to say about WWE or WWE wrestlers or whatever. WWE is a giant production. You know, wrestling is what they do. But they're truly, really trying to sell images and characters and stuff like that. They're not really trying to sell too much to physicality. But Will Ospreay should know for a fact that if he actually has to wrestle somewhere, he's probably not going to be very good at it. Because wrestling isn't doing handsprings and landing on your knees like you're fucking Spider-Man or some shit. That's not what wrestling is. Posing like a Power Ranger or the fucking Great Saiyan Man ain't pro wrestling. Stan Hansen didn't do any of that shit. All right? Terry Funk didn't, didn't, you know, tiptoe around like the Ginyu Force and pose and people go, Oh, I never seen nothing like that before. What the fuck are you talking about? He's one of these famous in Japan motherfuckers that nobody in the United States is going to give a fuck about. He's a Brit bong who is a Japanophile, uh, just another Kenny Omega. And, and to be quite honest, it's funny because he ended up taking, the only reason Real Spray is a star in Japan right now, the only reason he's famous in Japan is because Kenny Omega walked out and left. He was always going to be behind Kenny Omega. And it's weird because Kenny Omega only got there because AJ Styles left. So that should tell you the absolute state of Will Ospreay. <laughs> the only reason he got moved up is because other people left. He's not, not a star. Stars would have broken through anyway. He was the one white guy that was still there. And they was kind of like, fuck, Adam Cole left. AJ Styles left. Ooh, Young Bucks left. Kenny Omega left. Fuck it. Uh, Will Ospreay, I guess. He's the, either the him or Zack Sabre Jr. And Zack Sabre Jr. is like a, like the gingerbread man. He has no body. He has no personality. He's basically a Pinocchio. So it's kind of like, fuck it. You know, at least Will Ospreay has a heartbeat. You know, at least he has some snark in him. And nobody gives a fuck about Will Ospreay. Will Ospreay wrestles at Warrior Wrestling in front of like 700 people, if that. It is what it is, man. Nobody gives a fuck about Will Ospreay. But we're supposed to pretend that we care about Will Ospreay because he's famous in Japan. Just like all these other motherfuckers, Aussie Open. Who the fuck are this? I don't even know who they are. I am a hardcore wrestling fan. I watch New Japan. I haven't watched it that much lately. So I don't know who the fuck Aussie Open is. I'm like, who is that? Aaron Hanare? Who the fuck cares about that guy? Who cares about the great Okan? None of these people fucking matter in the long term. Nobody. Nobody cares about this fucking shit. How about making... See, this harkens back to the MJF thing. Right? The MJF gets in the middle of the ring and says, I'm the one that makes you feel... And I'm like, okay, that's true. On this show, I felt nothing. It was empty. It was a bunch of more belts, famous in Japan motherfuckers, more debuts. And I just kind of like, oh, okay, 
Sure. Okay. It seems like a lot is happening, but the the content of it is nothing. It's like, would you rather have like this nice full course meal with like your protein and your side, maybe a little carbs, or would you rather just sit around eating orange slices all day? Because that's what eating, that's watching dynamite is. It's like sitting around eating a giant bag of M and M's all at one time, completely empty, sugar, and once it's gone, it's gone. I ate M&M's during this show. I had to eat something. This show was driving me fucking crazy. I was like, fuck this. I even drank a pop today. I don't even drink pop. I, <laughs> I drank like a, what was like a 12 ounce can of uh, grape. I didn't even drink the whole thing because it was making my throat itch. This show fucking was fuck, so fucking stupid. And I was like, this show's stupid as fuck. Continuing with the stupidity. Hangman Page defeated David Finley. The shitty son of Fitch family. You know, the guy, another motherfucker who has no charisma whatsoever, no personality whatsoever. How could you, why would you? He's from Japan. Another famous in Japan motherfucker. So, uh, Hangman Page beats this guy. Who cares? Adam Cole is on commentary. Again, who cares? Hangman Page sipped the beer during the match. I guess that was him trying to be somewhat cool. After the match, he says that. There's a lot for him to say about AEW world title, but he's not going to say it. Says that he's not, he wasn't in the battle royal. So it's not seeming like he's going to get a title shot anytime soon. He was okay with that for some reason. Instead of nutting up and saying, Tony Khan fucked me over. He should have put me in that battle royal. He didn't put me in it because he knew I'd win it. He doesn't want me to be the world champion. He's favoring CM Punk, yada, yada, yada. Apparently we're back to babyface hangman page. All that anger and rage that he had about CM Punk. Nope. Went out of, where did it go? It didn't go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere. It was just for the angle of, you know, somebody had to be mean for the match. All in all, he says he's, there is more than one world title in professional wrestling. Challenged for the IWGP world title, he wants Okada. Giving Okada a soft opponent, I see. Um, yeah, okay. Adam Cole, see, now, I, I get it. Just pause before we get to Adam Cole. I get it. You kind of want to have one New Japan guy vying for the AEW world title, and you want to have one AEW guy vying for the IWGP world title. That's fine, except we know that neither one of those guys are going to win the opposite t- uh, company's belt. So you're probably just better off, you know, doing... A thing where it's like Super Clash. The Super Clash is the AWA concept, right? Where you know you would do these uh, these title matches, and sometimes they would be Super Clash Three is the most famous one because it was Jerry Lawler and um, Kerry Von Erich. That's when they actually did uh, combine the two world titles, and it led to what it led to, which is USWA and Jerry Lawler refusing to defend the AWA world title. Because he had gotten, he didn't get paid for Super Clash. Um, but it, it ended up being a complete and total debacle because, you know, these guys are agreeing to work together. You kind of just have to place a sacrificial lamb on on the slab and say, "This is one of our guys that we've pushed him. He's good. We're willing to use this guy to push your guy, put your guy over." And there was a point in time where. When um, after Jim Crockett Promotions bought the UWF, that they would do stuff like this. They would kind of have the UWF as its own thing, but it would be like kind of like Ring of Honor is now, where it's like not really wanted. It's like it's nice that it's there, but we really don't care about it. Um, then they would do stuff like have their undercard guys win those titles. You know, <laughs> like that's not going to happen here. Like Hangman Page is not beating Okada. It's not happening. So it's a match for the sake of matches. And to me, that kills the drama. I would much rather Okada wrestle somebody he might lose to in Japan and say that there might be an IWGP title switch in the United States. You know, because that'll, that'll ruffle the feathers of the Japanese wrestling fans. And they're like, wait a minute, you're going to change the title over in America? But it might be a treat for the American wrestling fans because they don't really get title switches that often. As opposed to, we know Hangman Page ain't beating Okada. It ain't happening. You know, it's not happening. Just like we know 
fucking Hiroti Goto is not about to be the AEW World Champion. We know that. Hiroshi Tanahashi, 10 years ago, probably would have been a good choice. Today, we know, broke down, Tanahashi ain't about to be the AEW World Champion. What am I paying for? Where's the drama in this show? This forbidden door. You're, you're hoping that hardcore wrestling fans buy this thing just because they like the concept, just because they like the matches, not because there might be something interesting coming out on the other side. Anyway, Adam Cole stands up, says that Hangman Page is delusional and that his good buddy Jay White actually might be the champion and that he doesn't think like a champion because he's not a champion. Hangman Page is not a champion anymore. And then it says that I deserve a shot at the IWGP title because I won the Owen Hart tournament. And it says that he's the new franchise player of AEW and that AEW is, is all about Adam Cole, baby. Uh, this was cringe. It's like, bro, didn't this dude get beat twice by Hangman Page? Why are they still feuding? You know, like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, why are they still feuding? It doesn't feel fresh enough. It's not. It's it's not. It's the same thing they was they was doing already. You know, it's like a continuance of the thing that they was just doing. You know, Hangman Page should be upset. He should have said, "Yeah, you guys should never trust CM Punk." He should have been stripped or whatever. Like, if he was gonna go heel with Adam Page or at least tease him being a heel, why not continue that? You know, at least it was something interesting. Him challenging Okada is just goofy. We know he's not going to win that title. Now, you know, it wouldn't even... Uh, the Japanese fan base would be pissed if Hangman won that belt. They'd be fucking angry. So why piss him off? You're not going to... And why build up Hangman to have him lose to Punk, then turn around, build him up again, and have him lose to Okada? <laughs> You're better off just saying, we're going to do a joint pay-per-view, you're going to have your world title match. We're going to have our world title match. But then we're going to have like some cross brand matches, which would have made you know some sense. It would have been fine. But just like the super clashes and after Jim Crockett promotions and WWE when they bought WCW, it's like when you absorb all these companies and you're doing crossovers and shit, it's very hard to decide a hierarchy because there needs to be a hierarchy. The fans at least are going to create one. Because the fans are going to say, all right, AEW essentially bought Ring of Honor, so they're not equals. So, you know, and since it's in the United States, New Japan is an add-on to the Forbidden Door. It's not a joint promotion, as people would say. It's a joint promotion. It's like New Japan can't really do that much in the United States. They don't have any foothold here. Not really. You know, the hope is that you have a bigger fan base in Japan that gets to buy this thing and or whatever. But they they can't be the the tip of the spear on this thing, so it has to be AEW. So the New Japan title is secondary because for starters, because the top guy is Hangman Page in this situation, and we just saw him lose on pay per view to another guy who's injured and won't be there. So. Hangman Page isn't the tippy top guy of AEW. I mean, that alone tells you who's the, the little spoon in this situation. It's 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 impact all over again. To the only there is really is no way to do crossovers and they make sense. You know? When all the titles and everything is going to be involved. It just really doesn't make any sense. And Adam Cole, you know, he's trying very hard to be somebody that stands out and I don't know. I don't think I'm interested enough in him. Thunder Rosa issued an open challenge to which Marina Shafir answered and says, and it was funny. Thunder Rosa, Chiquita, do you have a problem? And Marina Shafir with no energy whatsoever. I would like to be your problem. I like, that's not like something one of my ex-girlfriends would have said. I would like to be one of your problems. Like, uh uh-uh. Mm-mm. So Marina Shafir wrestles Thunder Rosa for the AEW Women's title. Apparently they they didn't use the ranking system because I don't see how Marina Shafir is anywhere near the top ten. Considering the last time I saw her, she was losing to Jay Cargill. Whatever. Uh, Marina Shafir botched a Boston Crab. Like she had a Boston Crab on Thunder Rosa, and 
couldn't hold position. And I was at that point kind of, kind of mentally checked out of this match. I was like, you know what? I didn't care about Marina Shafir anyway. But seeing that she can't really put on a Boston Crab and hold it, I don't think she needs my full attention. I wouldn't wash some clothes or something like that. I had to do something. When I came back, uh, Thunder Rosa won with a victory roll. Uh, after that, Marina Shafir jumped Thunder Rosa from behind. And Tony Storm came down there and made the save. Her Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm beat up Marina Shafir. And then they did the old... Challenger picks up the title and hands it to the champion, saying that Tony Storm is probably going to be the next contender for the title. And I said after her her interview with Renee, um, how about say Renee Dupree, Renee Paquette, makes sense that she would be a top contender now because you know one of the top ways to get it, you know, attention in AEW is to diss WWE, and she went on there and she really ran down on how you know WWE sucks and. She didn't feel like a priority there and yada, yada, yada. And she was trending for like two days because of that interview. And so that was her, her gateway out of the YouTube duty, you know, without dissing WWE, she probably still be wrestling on YouTube, but she did. And so she's going to get out of there. Now it's going to be fine for a while. Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm. That's fine. I don't, I'm not against that. Um, do I see Th- Tony Storm winning? Probably not. And that's what we're going to see is what's going to happen afterwards. What's going to happen afterwards? Because that's always going to be the issue. The issue is not what you're booking. The issue is, do you have any forward momentum afterwards? Not likely. But Thunder Rosa versus Marina Shafir, skip it. Uh, The Young Bucks declare themselves back and want to tag team championships. The Hardys interrupt, say that they deserve a shot because they beat the Young Bucks. Christian comes into the ring, comes into the locker room. I'm not even going to get into how stupid it is that everybody was eavesdropping. We're supposed to believe that four fucking guys were in the hallway and the doors were open. And, oh, they just happened to be walking by and the Young Bucks was cutting this promo. Come on. It's a, it's a joke, right? They were better off just doing this in the ring and having all these guys walk to the ring. At least, you know, it would have made more sense. So Christian says that he wanted to challenge all of them to a match. The match that made him and the Hardys famous. A ladder match. And Jungle Boy is like, what? Like, you can see Jungle Boy behind Christian. He's not happy about this. And that's the most character development Jungle Boy's had in months. (laughs) Him visually being unhappy about Christian's desire to put them in another triple threat match. This time, a ladder match is uh, the most character development Jungle Boy's had in a long time. Probably since he won that battle royal against Christian and lost that world title match to Kenny Omega. This has been the most character development he's had since. Um, So he obviously is unhappy with this. And maybe once they lose, he'll turn on Christian or something. But how did we go from Jeff Hardy was knocked unconscious in a regular tag team match at double or nothing. And they say to themselves, you know what? We'll give them two weeks off and then put them in a fucking ladder match. Jeff Hardy. Why are they trying to murder this man? Why are they trying to hurt this man so badly? Can this man work a regular match, please? Can he get through a series of regular matches and, and heal up? Without being having to jump off shit. Jeff Hardy and AEW is like fucking looking at the whales of SeaWorld at this point. It's like jump through the hoop. Jump through the hoop. It's like that's not naturally what he does. There's a limit to this shit. We're just going to keep beating the fucking elephant until he learns how to do the tricks that you want him to, tr- to do. It's like Jeff is not that young man anymore. Come on. Matt is not that young man anymore. Come the fuck on. Cut him some slack. Please. I love the Hardys. I don't want their brains to be out here like fucking science projects. That's not what I want. I don't want Jeff Hardy stepping crayons up his nose or some shit because you didn't fuck them up on one of these stupid ass shows you're doing. A fucking regular TV match. I don't want that. Somebody needs to step in and say, you know what? Maybe we need to have a moratorium on Jeff Hardy jumping off shit 
until he can get through three or four consecutive singles matches or tag team matches that are normal rules without hurting himself or someone else. If he can do that, then we'll put him in a ladder match. Until he can do the normal, everyday, regular fucking match. Keep him away from ladders. But no. Because they say, they see Hardy Boys, the only thing they can think of is ladders. That's apparently, only thing he's good for is jumping off shit. So, that's what we got. I feel bad for you, Jeff. Poe baby. Just, man, hang in there, bro. <laughs> Just hang in there. Uh, don't... I don't know, man. They gonna want, and, hard, and look, the, the young bucks are gonna want to do some silly shit, man. They gonna be wanting to do dumb shit. It's Matt and Jeff need to learn how to say no. You know, they need to learn how to say no. It's been tables matches and ladder matches and no disqualification matches the whole time they've been there. They ain't been there that long. You know, they probably worked. You could probably count on one hand how many rule matches with normal tag team rules. The Hardy Boys have wrestled since they've been in AEW. You could probably count it on one hand. Embarrassing. Wardlow. Wardlow's out there. I mentioned earlier that he didn't want to be in the Battle Royal. And that these men have diminished the TNT title. And I want to talk about this for a moment. Because Tony Khan, he has a knack for just listening to what the audience says and then having a wrestler repeat it. Right? There's certain things, and this is the pro- the problem when you have the 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 booker who is listening to the fans. You're not creating anything new. You're basically just saying this is what the fans think. Therefore, this is what this guy thinks. And he's like, there have been guys who have diminished the the reverence for the TNT title. And I'm like, why would he say that? You know, like why would you shit on on Scorpio Sky that way? You know, this is not. Wardlow saying this, we know that this sentiment is coming from a subsection of the AEW fan base, the the uh, the Cornette crowd and the Meltzers and the Alvarezes. All of those people are the ones who say the TNT title doesn't mean anything anymore because of Guevara and Scorpio Sky and how they're not over and they suck and all that kind of stuff. It's those guys saying that shit. So what you're doing is you're listening to them and then putting that in the show. It was people telling you, Warlow should be the TNT champion. You were like, you know what? Okay, we'll, we'll do that. You, this is what I mean by Tony Khan is naive. You know, if this wasn't your plan to put the TNT title on Warlow, this isn't going to help you because this is going to be anticlimactic. You're just doing it because people told you it was a good idea, not because you came up with it and you can build up the drama and the anticipation for it. It was just, you did it because someone told you to do it. Which is why it got the reaction that it got, which is minimal. So, Scorpio Sky, Lambert, and all those guys come out there. And Warlow very kindly says that it's time for a change in the TNT title picture. And that since Scorpio Sky has a bum knee, he'll wait till he's 100%. Mark Sterling then says some shit about the, 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 the security guards that Warlow beat up, they want to match with him or they want money. So either they want to... They, like, what? So they created this 20-on-one elimination-style match that these that these security guards want. I'm like, this is stupid. This is... That doesn't even make any fucking sense. Oh, <laughs> we're all... We're going to class action sue you or we're going to beat you up 20-on-one. Oh, what? <laughs> oh, okay, sure, whatever. That's how, that's how legal legalese works, you know. Maybe Law and Order SVU needs to pick that up. You're a rapist, but we'll put you five minutes in the room with the victim, <laughs> and they'll get their justice that way. Everything involves Mark Sterling as the shits. Get rid of this fucking guy. You know, maybe just not having him around will increase in better storytelling without him being around. He sucks. Warlow being a TNT champion is the right idea, but it's not compelling. It's not you're building no anticipation. 
you know, and you just done what the people told you to do instead of thinking for yourself and saying, okay, we'll do that, but here's how we'll get to it. It's just kind of like, nope, we're going to completely ignore everything that we had going on with Wardlow and we're just going to throw him in the title picture because we don't know what else to do. This is what the fans want, but we ain't got no plans for it. So I guarantee you, Wardlow's not going to be really a good champion because there was no plan. It's they're doing it to satisfy people who think that just putting a belt on Wardlow will keep him hot when it will not. It won't because Wardlow has not done anything since he beat MJF. There's, there's no heat here, you know? So whatever. Um, it just occurred to me when, they, when I mentioned that Scorpio sky was hurt. I think, uh, Brian Danielson was hurt at the pay-per-view. Um, I think he was injured. That's why he wasn't in the battle Royal. Uh, I think, I don't know what his injury was though. So I don't know how serious it was. So maybe that's why he wasn't in the battle Royal. But even if you didn't have Danielson in it, cause he was hurt and maybe you don't have somebody else in it cause they were hurt. You know, clearly you have plans for some other people like Miro and Malachi black. You still got to put them in this, in this, and they weren't wrestling on this night. So you could have said they got an opportunity to win two belts in one night. That's what they did with Roddy Piper at WrestleMania 8. Or Rus- not WrestleMania, but Royal Rumble uh, 92. He wrestled for the Intercontinental title. And then he was also in the Royal Rumble match for the WWF title. So he had an opportunity to win both belts in one night. And that was great. Because once he won the Intercontinental title, people was like, Roddy could do it. Roddy could win both. And uh, people were very excited about that. That was great. That was awesome. That ruled. That was back when wrestling booking made was very good and made sense. Uh, only thing after this was Jay Cargill and her cut the shit moment because she got to do that. And some stuff about them making fun of Chris Statlander who doesn't who isn't on the show and more Rampage crew stuff. Who cares? Um, AEW is not doing a good job. They're not. They're it's showing how bad that the show suffers without their top talkers and the MJFs and the punks. They didn't even have a punk on commentary this week, which was smart. They kept him off the show. Keep him off the show until, you know, I think he had surgery this morning. So it was what it was. I would say don't bring him back until he's 100% ready to wrestle. That's what I say. I say, leave him off the show until he's ready to wrestle. Let him give a big triumphant return, big reaction, big pop. Him and Moxley stare at each other, belts in the air. We go into whatever pay-per-view that is where they prove which one of them is the real world's champion. I'm I'm 100% down for that. That makes sense. How are we going to get there? It's going to be absolute dog shit. You know, it's like, again, the story is not in the ending. The story is the journey. If the, if the story is that you have to go save the princess. Okay. So now we know how the story ends. Mario is going to say princess peach. That's how the story ends. Now, what we're reading the book for or playing the video game for or whatever is for the journey to be good. Like, we already know what the goal is. And sometimes the goal, of course, is in flux. It's wrestling. You could be, the goal is to be world champion. Sometimes you get that world title match and you lose. You know, that's the, you know, the Liv Morgan story. She got there and she lost. That can be, you know, entertaining in its own way. But in most stories, you're pretty much told the ending at the beginning. You're told... My grand, my dad is in the belly of the whale. It's Pinocchio. I'm going to go save my dad. It's like, okay, we know that you're not going to not save your dad. So you're going to save your dad, but let's talk about the story of how you're going to get there. And that's the intriguing part. And AEW is not doing a good job of making that part intriguing. They, they come up with these really good matches, but then they put no story behind them. And it actually makes them worse. It makes it actively makes it worse. It's like WWE comes up with good matches and they do it over and over and over and over and over again, actively making it worse. The booking in this in these in this in the modern wrestling is absolute dog shit. You can't just keep throwing titles on things. You can't keep doing surprise debuts on things. You can't just hot shot things. That's not how, what wrestling is. Wrestling is not hot shotting, swerving, and all that other garbage. Those things just add layers to the stories that you're supposed to be telling. Tell some fucking stories. AEW has just shot themselves in the in the foot with a cannon. Fuck this show. 